I'm Tim Ventura, and in this presentation, Jean-Francois Genest discusses a novel approach to physics to increase the coherency of physical models, which also facilitates gravity modification through a coupling between gravity and electromagnetism. He'll also be discussing disruptive expectations for advances in zero-point energy. Jean-Francois is the CEO of the World Advanced Research Project Agency and a former vice president and chief scientist at Airbus, a professor of disruptive innovation at the Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology in Moscow, and formerly served EADS Astrium as a scientific advisor and senior manager of innovation. Uh, so first of all, who am I? So I'm both an engineer, this is my school, and a mathematician. I have a PhD in cryptology at Sorbonne University. My dad was a physics teacher at a high school. And from the very beginning, I was very shocked by the lack of consistency in physics coherence currents. Uh, I worked a lot uh, uh, math, uh, of math in my career, uh, but uh, I went back to uh, physics. I'm sorry, but I have a, a, a little problem. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I can't see my... Uh, ju just wait a minute. Okay, this is better. Uh, and uh, um, I, I went back to, to physics in 2002 after a lot of math uh, upon my demand. Uh, I wanted to, I thought at that time that I had a background large enough to tackle physics again and maybe overcome its inconsistencies. However, it was even much worse than when I was young. Uh, and so I decided to make physics great again. Sorry for the word game. Uh, um, and uh, uh, trying to rebuild it from scratch in a fully consistent way. I, I try to do this. This is part of what I will say today, and I hope you will be convinced. Uh, uh, and uh, I wrote my first book of theoretical physics in French in 2010. Uh, and in his preface, uh, I was very much criticized by the professors. So a director of research of CNRS in France and a, a Russian guy from the Korchatov Institute, physicist, uh, who think, I think, I think they still think that um, this is not the right way to do research in physics. Uh, okay, and they agreed that physics is not coherent globally, uh, but by parts. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they think that we can only progress through experiments. I'm not against this point of view, but uh, we will see what I can propose. Uh, so, however, I fully disagree on the principle that uh, we should tackle uh, the global coherency of physics. If it's not, it means that we are in a wrong way in, uh, in, in some way. Uh, so, let me go to some re basic remarks. So, the limitations of the modern man. I, I would want to compare the Middle Ages man with the uh, man of today. And in my opinion, the Middle Ages man was much freer than uh, we are today, uh, because today orthodox physics prevents us from many things, creating energy out of nothing, the first principle of thermodynamics, creating order, second principle, flying quicker than the speed of light, special relativity, having infinite accuracy, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and finding a cause to every phenomenon, because as you know, uh, quantum physics is not causal. So uh, what's next? There are, I could have added some points to this, but I, I firmly uh, believe uh, personally uh, that physics should be causal. And we will see uh, when, in my opinion, did occur the non-causality in physics. And maybe you will be surprised. So I will now go through some things I, I think are flaws of, of physics. And I will start with the epicycles, so which you know are dating back to uh, ancient Greece and the uh, Ptolemaic epicycles. Uh, this theory survived until Kepler uh, in the 1500s. And uh, you know, if Kepler had had a personal computer at that time, it, in the model of that time, he would have put say 20 million circles, it would have converged to a, a, uh, an ellipse. And, uh, but nobody would have maybe detected the ellipse. It, it would have just proved that the, 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 the model was working. And he would have had much more uh, 
accuracy than he got from experience at the time. Uh, so we were lucky that uh, Kepler didn't have any personal computer. Uh, and uh, just a, a final notice that the origin of the epicycles was religious. Uh, the, the circle is, was considered as something religious and perfect in nature in ancient Greece. So just look, the Ptolemaic epicycles uh, in 300 before Christ, in 1500 Kepler, so 1800 years. And what did happen in 1924? There was the De Broglie uh, 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 wave, which was introduced uh, uh, in his uh, physics thesis, and it was magic. It worked. But very few criticized, uh, even if some did, at that time, the, the reintroduction of a new epicycle theory of Fourier transform, because epicycles are Fourier transform, basically. Uh, and. Uh, um, we are still there in 2021, quantum physics describes through a Fourier transform, all the events which do occur. And as you know, any non two pathological function does have a Fourier transform. So you can tackle almost everything with this and be very accurate if you pile up the harmonics. Uh, so it seems that nobody really complains about this. Uh, in the meanwhile, the true waves uh, you know, there is kind of irony in this. Um, de Broglie thought that his wave was a true physical wave. He got his Nobel Prize for this because we could see interference of waves. And now it's believed that these are waves of probability, which is much more, um, much less concrete, at least. Uh, so uh, what is de Broglie's waves uh, uh, exactly? We, we don't really know. Uh, so quantum physicists justify the theory uh, in some way, unfortunately, uh, which is non-causal once again, and does not follow the Kolmogorov actions. You know, the Kolmogorov actions are the actions of probability. They have been settled in uh, uh, 1933 uh, and are widely used. So if you use Kolmogorov actions, you can't perform any quantum physics. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, so the justification of quantum physics today is just saying that physicists get an accuracy which was never possible before and which justifies the power of, what, of their approach. Personally, I think that they don't understand a clue of what happens really because they are just we're manipulating Fourier transforms and harmonics. Um, so another one, and let's tackle Feynman now. You have on the right the Coulomb force and the gravitational force, which are expressed in yellow and green. And Feynman, in his books, both uh, electromagnetism and, and gravitation, he just write that the approach by the force, which is a physical phenomenon, is exactly equivalent to the approach with a field. And you have the field uh, in yellow and green once again uh, uh, under. Uh, which are written, but this is logically completely false because in the force approach, you have a two body problem and you cannot transform, you don't have the right, it's not equivalent to say that this is equivalent to a one body uh, problem. And so, and in addition, the one body problem would contradict the second uh, uh, principle of thermodynamics. So this is the flaw. Now, uh, Tim asked me to think about uh, our exper experimenters, engineers, and uh, I'm going to present to you now two uh, thought experiments, which I was not able to carry out. So if there are some volunteers, uh, volunteers sorry, to, to do this, to carry this out, it would be very nice because uh, it's a bit tricky. On the, on the left, you have a magnet, permanent magnet. And on the right, uh, you have a, a coil. So the, everybody knows that when you move the, the coil or the magnet, you get a, a, a voltage. And with the famous formula, E equals minus d phi over dt. And the problem is the following. If, imagine that the, the magnet and the coil are 30 centimeters away 
from each other. So it's in terms of uh, speed of light, it's one nanosecond uh, uh, speed of light, uh, one nanosecond light away one, uh, from uh, each other. Now, the theory tells us that the, the magnet emits uh, um, a field, a magnetic field, which englobes the coil. And uh, so, Look at the at the drawing on the bottom. If you move the coil to the left in the field, you will have a cut flux instantaneously. And then, so you will have the voltage instantaneously. Now, if in on the picture uh, um, on the top, if you move the magnet, in theory, what you would be expecting with what we know is that you need to wait for the propagation of change in, in, the, in the field up to the coil uh, that it propagates and reaches the coil. So since we are at one nanosecond light away, uh, we would have, or we could have, or we should have a delay, a delay of one nanosecond in the signal uh, and in, in the voltage measurement. So, uh, isn't this a contradiction with special relativity? Because what special relativity says is that you cannot detect who is moving, either, either the coil or the magnet. And with this thought experiment, uh, in one case, you, would ha you wouldn't have any delay. And in the other one, you would have one delay, one nanosecond. So um, I try to, to look at what we can do with uh, macroscopic uh, big big magnets and uh, and coils. Um, so basically, since we have one nanosecond uh, delay potentially to measure it, we would need to have a shock of the same order of magnitude or even less, ten to the minus ten, for example, seconds. And it's very difficult to to achieve this uh, experimentally. Uh, in fact, it was not possible when I tried. Uh, then the idea was to use uh, uh, nanomagnets um, with a very short shock from uh, lasers, for example, and to use squids uh, 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 for the coil. Uh, but uh, when the university I contacted at that time in France was aware of the reason why we wanted to do this, they refused to carry out the experiment. So, which can seem a bit strange, but if someone wants to do this, it's quite interesting. Uh, let me show you now another uh, thought experiment uh, for the same problem uh, and, and another point of view, but which uh, is equivalent to the same, in fact, uh, conclusion. Imagine we have an electron, which is in green, and a wall, a fully absorbent wall, 100% absorbent wall at one meter of it, and uh, a coil at two seconds light from the, the, the experiment. <clears throat> now, the, the T0 time of the experiment uh, starts just after the shock when the electron has a uh, rectilinear uh, constant speed of one meter per second. So uh, <clears throat> when you have this, uh, the uh, the energy the, uh, of, of the of the system is uh, the uh, kinetic energy of the electron. At, this is what I call T zero. Uh, after one second, uh, you know, one meter per second, we are at one meter, so we. Collide, we collide with the, with the wall, purely fully absorbent. And so we have conservation of energy and we will get uh, the same energy, but uh, in, under the form of heat plus radiation because uh, the, ex, the electron will have decelerated. But after two seconds, you know, uh, because of the, the fact that we had a, a current, the equivalent of a current with the constant speed of the electron, uh, there was uh, the creation of a, uh, a field, so the field propagated and re reaches the coil. And at two seconds, we have an energy, which is the kinetic energy, of course, and you must add the uh, <coughs> induction uh, uh, current 
uh, in the coil, uh, which is more than what we had at, at the beginning. And as you know, uh, in such kind of circuit, normally <clears throat> the um, uh, magnetic field which will be created in the coil will uh, have a, a, a trend to counter the, the, the phenomenon who, uh, which created the, the, the magnetic field in the coil. And, but the problem is that you have some delay and so you cannot prevent this from uh, happening at the right time. So because of the delay, uh, you don't have conservation of energy in the system for a while. Of course, if you go to four seconds, uh, you, you remove the problem. But uh, for the trans transitory phase, so of course, this is the thought experiment. Two seconds light is very big, but uh, uh, with uh, accelerators of particles and purely uh, absorbing walls and uh, coils not too far away with uh, good clocks, maybe there is something which can be uh, measured. <clears throat> Let's go to uh, Maxwell equations. So you have in green the four Maxwell equations and uh, uh, they correspond to a situation uh, uh, on the picture on the right where you have the Z zone uh, in which you have uh, charges and currents and uh, what is expressed with the uh, Maxwell equations is the, the field on, in point, at point P. Um, now, if you mix up all these four equations, which is well known, you get the equation in yellow. Um, and uh, with after Hertz experiments, it was confirmed what Maxwell himself did so he, he said that in the vacuum, there is no charge, so no current. And so you can write the blue equation, in fact. And of course, after Hertz experiments, uh, it, it, it looked like B uh, as confirmed what Maxwell did. And this is what everybody knows as, a, as, as the, the wave equation. The problem is uh, there are at least two problems with this. But the, the biggest one for me is the one that when you say that there is vacuum, you know, in the, in the yellow equation, it's very nice because you have a cause. The causes are the charges and the currents. And of course, you have a field corresponding to this. But when you say rho equals zero and j equals zero, so no charges, no current, you cancel the cause and your physics becomes no, no, no more causal. And for me, the origin of non-causality of uh, physics and quantum physics in particular com comes from this uh, very approach. Uh, in addition, you know, you have uh, another trick, uh, which uh, I don't like at all as a mathematician. You have the, the gradient of, of the charge. And the problem is that uh, we, we know with quantum physics that we have uh, charges, uh, which you cannot, uh, for example, for the electron, you cannot derive. Uh, it doesn't work. So you have the distribution, uh, theory of distribution, but uh, the gradient by itself uh, is in no way, you don't have any right to do this. I turn to general relativity and, uh, you know, this very well known formula, uh, which is in fact exactly the same equation as the blue one here, uh, but in, geom in uh, Riemannian geometry. This is exactly the same. And to, to get the wave equation, you know, you cancel the T alpha beta and you, you get the wave equation in, relativity, in general relativity, relativity. And this is the way you have the gravita gravitational waves. Uh, and once again, uh, there is a big problem because it's no more causal. So basically, if I can, if I, summarize what I said about the Maxwell equation and the general, general relativity equation, uh, you know, basically it means that this, the blue equation here and this equivalent in uh, gravitation uh, is, should be zero equals zero. And why are we looking for a non-trivial solution uh, to, to this equation, which uh, zero equals zero should mean that there is nothing and no field in fact. Okay, uh, so I, I have, when saying this, I have the point of view that the field doesn't really exist and 
particles do exist and have an effect. Why do the approach uh, of the field work is a big question. And the big question is, is it a statistical point of view or what happens with particles uh, or not? You know, this is the deep question I'm wondering about. Uh, so now the flaws of physics and uh, focusing on quantum physics. Uh, so quantum physics is non-causal. Quantum physics doesn't follow the actions of Kolmogorov, I told you already. Quantum physics cannot be complete. This is the Levin theorem of 2004. Quantum physics and relativity are not compatible for because of um, uh, basically uh, entangled particles. And gravitation is out of the scope of quantum physics, as everybody knows. And, uh, uh, you know, because of the item before, uh, uh, quantum physics and relativity are not compatible. Uh, uh, I think that uh, it's a no way to try to force into quantum physics uh, gravitation. It would not work. This is my opinion, at least. Now, uh, as Tim said and uh, announced, so one remark about uh, zero point energy. So, in the theory of quantum physics, uh, zero point energy is infinite. Uh, therefore, tapping any finite quantity out of the vacuum does not change the ZP. And hence, we can contradict the first principle of thermodynamic and create energy out of nothing without contradicting the, uh, you know, the corpus of quantum physics. Because if you take any finite quantity out of an infinite one, it is equivalent to not tapping anything out. So um, it can work in some way, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not coherent, it's not... Uh, uh, rigorous. Uh, so now, just to, for for fun, uh, uh, ju uh, just look at this. So a science fiction scenario for ZP globalization will be over say, in one hundred years. So we will have uniformized way of life uh, over the planet, uh, and so we will have potentially no more growth because today globalization is a vector of growth. It creates uh, uh, trouble in Western countries because we are delocalizing uh, our stuff in uh, Asia, for example, low wage countries. But uh, let's hope that in 100 years it's over and no more growth. So what, what will be uh, uh, the, the, how can we create the growth next time when, when the globalization is over? So the idea would be, we make a second globalization, but is it possible? In fact, the idea is use ZP to bring Venus on the same orbit as the Earth in phase opposition to the Earth. So the, the change in gravity will be very, very low, 10 to the minus six uh, in uh, relative uh, change. Let us terraform Venus with GMOs uh, for, and let's say it will take 25 years with the GMOs, so we will transform Venus from a CO2 planet into an oxygen planet. And let's accomplish the second globalization. We'll send people there. We are about 8 billion today. So we can expect to put 8 billion additional people, humans, on Venus. Uh, and we could keep on this uh, scenario. And uh, let's take Mars then, agglomerate it with some asteroids uh, from the belt and then make it something which is uh, around the same size as the Earth. And let's make an, equi an equilateral triangle uh, around the, on the orbit of the Earth, around the Sun. Uh, and then we have a third uh, potential uh, globalization. Um, and we, have, we create some kind of redundancy for uh, the humankind. Uh, now, let's transform this uh, purely science fiction scenario into a scientific scenario. Let's observe uh, exoplanets. And if we find two or more planets orbiting uh, the same uh, uh, orbit uh, around a star, uh, then maybe we, we, we can guess that some intelligent people there uh, have faced uh, this problem of globalization and uh, uh, to, to make several globalizations for for the system. Uh, so there might be intelligent life. 
And what is interesting in this, you know, so we can we can do this, we can observe this, and 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 instead of looking for telluric planets, saying ah oh, they look like ours and maybe there is a life as we, we are we interested in finding life as we have on Earth, or are we interested in finding intelligent life? If we are looking for intelligent life. The interest of this scenario is that you don't need any telluric planet in the end. You just need a planet, two planets or more, uh, having the same orbit around their sun. Uh, so, quite interesting, in my opinion, to to see this and uh, and very easy experimentally to to look at the sky. And uh, if one day we we find find such a case, uh, it could be interesting to point some uh, communication means to in, in this in this direction. Uh, so it was the first part. Let me go now to the second part, which is my scientific approach. So which is mathematical. I apologize in advance for the mathematical approach, uh, which I hope will not be too much boring. Um, so I'm starting with the basics of quantum physics. So the quantum physics has been axiomatized uh, with five axioms. To any quantum system is associated the Hilbert space. This is the first one. The system is described by a norm one vector in the Hilbert space. To any physical magnitude is associated a Hermitian operator and the measurement consists in choosing, because this is important, an eigenvalue of it. And this value is the result of the measure. The Schrodinger equation, of course, and to two quantum systems is associated a tensor product of their, respons their respective Hilbert spaces. And if the representation vector cannot be decomposed into a tensor product of vectors, then the two quantum systems are said to be entangled. And this is the general case entanglement. Uh, uh, free particles is a very exceptional case. So what misses, and this is, you know, I'm going to criticize this point of view by quantum physicists, which is overwhelmingly known over the world. First of all, let us remember Euclid's elements, 300 before Christ. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, in Euclid's elements, there were five actions. But with the five actions, it, it was not enough. There were what Euclid ca uh, called common notions. Uh, and in fact, Hilbert proved, so, you know, 300 before Christ, 1899, so uh, some time has passed, and Hilbert proved that many of the common notions uh, need to be considered as uh, uh, actions. So uh, in the end, if you want to build with only actions, Euclidean geometry, you need about 20 actions. You can see this in the famous book of Hilbert, The Element of Geometry. Um, this is roughly the same in quantum physics. Why? Because in fact, quantum physics introduces, uh, you could see this from the beginning, Hilbert space. So Hilbert space is not, uh, you know, you need actions to, uh, to involve Hilbert spaces and Hilbert spaces are there for the geometry. So basically, Hilbert spaces uh, define a Euclidean geometry. So you need 20 actions. And then you have the five actions of uh, quantum physics. And in the end, you, quantum physics today is based on about, about, I don't count them exactly, but about 25 actions and not five, which is completely different. Uh, now, just a reminder about uh, mathematics what a theory is composed of. It is composed of undefined terms, defined terms, actions, logic, and theorems. I'm going to give you some more uh, uh, details about this. Why undefined terms? Because you, you are going to consider entities. Let's take the example of geometry. You are going to define, to, to, to speak about points and lines, but if you, if you define a point, then you will have some new vocabulary, uh, which you will use. And then you need to define vocabulary. And then you, you go down, 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 defining all the terms, and it never ends. So from some starting point, 
you need to have undefined terms. And in geometry, the undefined terms are the points and the lines. You never know if you look at in, what, what we call intrinsic geometry, the lines and the points, you don't know what it is. They are not defined, they are undefined. Then you have defined terms. So for example, you say that uh, two, two lines are parallel if they don't uh, have an intersection, for example. Okay, so, uh, but undefined terms is very, very important. The actions, of course, and they must be non-contradictory. The logic is the way we, uh, we, we, we make some reasoning. And then the theorem, which you get from use about the undefined and defined terms using the actions and the logic system to get some new properties, uh, but which were underlying. Uh, in fact, they, they are not really new. The next step is to interpret the undefined terms. So for example, uh, still with geometry, you can consider you have bikes and you have chains uh, linking the bikes and the bikes will represent, will be the interpretation of the points of geometry and the chains will be the representation of the lines. Probably you, you maybe you never saw that or you never heard of it, but uh, this is the way it works. And this interpretation brings you to what we call a model. Uh, if the interpreted terms verify the actions, then they will, the system will verify all the theorems you can draw out of the theory, which is composed of undefined terms, defined terms, actions, logic, and theorems. In general, in physics, unfortunately, everybody works with a model. And generally, the model is based on the real or complex numbers. Uh, just let me take an example, uh, given what I said before. Uh, if you ask a physicist what a point is in space, uh, it will ask you uh, in which dimension, but uh, for example, in four dimension, if we are speaking about relativity, and you will have uh, x, y, z, t for the coordinates, and it will tell you that the point is a, 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 quadrup a quadruple of the coordinates. And for, for, the, for the physicist, this is a point. It cannot be, because this is defined. So it means that physicists today work in a model. They don't work in uh, a theory, which is a full theory, intrinsic theory. So for me, there is a parent flaw in this approach because working for a model, uh, you are always uh, pushing your model ahead, but this is a model and you are limited by your own model. You are not in the theory. So for me, there is a big, a big, big problem there. Let's keep on. Now I'm going, so I'm going to go a bit uh, quick through this, uh, uh, some slides now, because I'm, I'm going to reproduce uh, what you can find in Reiner's course in thermodynamics. Reiner is a German guy, uh, good, very good physicist. And uh, his explanation and his model is are quite interesting. So just consider a, a, a system system with uh, n particles and uh, you consider this, the, the phase space of these particles, so which are written in green here, Q, Q, V, P, V. Uh, so, uh, and you will consider this in a space of 6n dimensions. Uh, then you have the Hamiltonian uh, equations, uh, which uh, uh, are the driver of the evolution of the system. Uh, and then you have the element of volume in the phase space, which is uh, uh, written uh, on the right, uh, uh, bottom right. And then the, if your system is uh, isolated, uh, the Hamiltonian is constant equal to the energy. Basically, this is the approach of uh, uh, Boltzmann. Uh, then you mix a bit of uh, uh, mathematics, uh, traditional ones, uh, basically geometry, and uh, you try to express uh, the number of uh, um, uh, configurations you can have, giving you this, uh, 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 this equation on the bottom here, uh, which is the equation of a surface, in fact. Uh, so the, uh, the, the energy uh, uh, surface. 
so I'm going through this quite quickly. Uh, you have some, uh, uh, not French cuisine, but some cuisine, in fact. Okay, you mix this up and you can uh, achieve uh, the writing of uh, something which looks like uh, the entropy of the system. And, uh, and this is an analogy. This is not uh, quite uh, rigorous, but this is an analogy. And uh, uh, you, when counting the number of states, you, you can check that the log of the number of states uh, uh, works like entropy. Entropy had been uh, discovered before by some engineers and not physicists and uh, is known to be an additive uh, uh, magnitude. Uh, so you do this, you have your beautiful formula, which is Boltzmann formula, that the, the entropy is K, the Boltzmann constant times log of the number of configurations. You consider then the uh, perfect gas uh, with its uh, well-known uh, Hamiltonian. And then you get uh, very naturally, I would say, and it seems very rigorous, the expression of the entropy of the perfect gas. And you are pleased, but unfortunately, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because this formula, the one before, big green formula here, is not extensive. It means that what you get is not additive. On the contrary of what we, we thought before, and which has, it had been uh, built for. Uh, and to fix the problem, in fact, it, it's, uh, it only suffices to consider that uh, the particles are what the physicists called indistinguishable. <clears throat> indistinguishable, so you had a certain number of configurations before. Uh, if I come back uh, here. Uh, and this number of configuration is not the right one because uh, it would be the right one if every particle could be uh, distinguished from the others. If we cannot, we need to uh, divide by factorial n. And then by magic, uh, you know, if you do this, you get a new expression. And this expression works well and corresponds to experiment. So this is nice. And this is what is in all books of thermodynamics over the world today. Uh, but the problem is that doing this reasoning, we made a mistake, a mistake, a mathematical mistake, a mistake of logic, in fact. Uh, so let me refer to Kleene, who was a very uh, famous uh, uh, um, uh, mathematician and uh, specialist in logic and who said that we must not make any confusion between congruence and equality. Equality is something which is much stronger than congruence. Congruence is, uh, you, know, you need to think about uh, equivalence relation. Of course, equality is an equivalence relation, but it's much stronger. Equality must verify the substitute property, which, and this was defined by Leibniz, in fact. He is the guy who, who is at the origin of this. And, <clears throat> So uh, to, to give you an idea of what is at stake, let's go back to primary school uh, at math, the first year when you were uh, told how to count. And so what was the method? The method was that you had identical tokens and you, begin, you began with zero token, one, two, and so on, okay? The tokens are identical, but they are not the, in the same place. And therefore, they cannot be distinguished uh, as tokens themselves, but they can be distinguished by their position. And if it was not the case, if they couldn't be distinguished, there should be only one token, not two or three or 10, just one. And this is the same for the gas molecules I considered before. You know, If you cannot distinguish the molecules, there is only one. And when you look at the different uh, uh, macroscopic equations, for example, the equation of perfect gas, you have the mass, and the mass is, counts the number of molecules in some way. <clears throat> so you, you need to be able to count 
So it means that the particles ultimately are distinguishable and not indistinguishable, indistinguishable as physicists used to say. Uh, coming back to the tokens, at microscopic level, in reality, no one is identical to the others, and it could be the same with our gas molecules, but we don't know. You know, generally, when you have two, two molecules of, uh, say, hydrogen, for example, everybody thinks that they are exactly the same, and it, that if you were inside the molecule, you couldn't uh, distinguish between molecule one and molecule... We don't know. We don't know, and I think that maybe we, we, we can we should be able to uh, distinguish this. Um, so uh, the idea is that we, we need to consider, therefore, as much for the gas molecules as for the tokens, an equivalence relation and not an equality, and therefore kind of a distinguishability. Uh, let's go a bit more through physical mathematics. This brings us to assume that all the physical magnitude, magnitudes, uh, which are extensive, like mass, charge, number of particles, enthalpy, and so, and so on, are all congruences. And, we, and when we look at them through the uh, um, entropy, for example, we see nature as, we were, as if we were myopic. It means that the entropy doesn't distinguish the particles, but it doesn't mean they are indistinguishable. They are, but it, it's a fact that entropy doesn't distinguish them. This implies that if we take this as granted, that the, all the extensive magnitudes uh, are the sum of magnitudes associated to what I call subparticles for now. Uh, I will give you some uh, more details after that, uh, which are indistinguishable at the initial scale of magnitude, we are treating them. You know, in some way, uh, it, what I say there is that entropy looks from far away enough as a myopic function to the particles and don't see the, the fact that they are not the same. But this is the entropy. We could, we could use something else and which would be able to distinguish them. And for example, the mass will distinguish. If I take the example of the charge, the charge of the electron, which is believed to be the electron, a fundamental particle, so which cannot be cut. Uh, it becomes a sum of things. For now, we don't know what it is. At a smaller scale, and the electron, as a consequence, has components. You know that today in quantum physics, the electron has no components. It doesn't have even a radius. I will come back on this later. And we therefore, to some extent, contradict quantum orthodox physics uh, in which the term particle, on an axiomatic point of view, is an undefined term. Quantum physicists never say that particles are undefined terms, but they should be in the way they present this if they want it to be a little bit, uh, uh, I would say, uh, rigorous, which they are not. Let's go on. Of course, in their turn, the components of the electron must have components, and so on. Let us write the successive constituents, uh, constituent sets. So, uh, of the uh, you know the electron are made of subparticles, so which are in C one, and then the, the particles of C one are made of subparticles C two, and so on. And you can keep on like this. Of course, the particles since they are so uh, uh, you know, uh, they are, the radius must be uh, smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, let's consider the intersection of all these uh, uh, components in terms of geometric uh, um, uh, sets. And uh, therefore, uh, this, we are here at this stage, we are doing some geometry. And uh, uh, so we have uh, with a well-known uh, theorem about re the reals, that the limit of this, uh, uh, of the radius, is zero. And if we assume that uh, the, the number of subcomponents, uh, the subcomponents are uh, the, uh, the, the, yes, the subcomponents form a set, uh, we, the intersection, in fact, is a point. And the point is dimensionless. Of course, the point has no dimension. And so we have a contradiction because we take 
the intersection of things. And we said that it must have always components. So it means that in this, we made a mistake in this reasoning. And in fact, the mistake, we, we just made one assumption. The only assumption we made is that S is a set. It means that S cannot be a set. S cannot be a set. And uh, what does it mean? It means that in, on a mathematical point of view, S must be what we call a proper class. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, you know, you, uh, at, at the time, you, we, there was a, a, uh, Gottlob Frede, uh, the, the guy who invented basically uh, set theory in, in the 19th century, he wrote a book. And uh, the, the book was under printing. And uh, you had uh, Russell, I think it was Russell. Russell said, oh, but there is a problem in your set theory uh, because uh, does the set of all sets exist? And if you make, uh, I will, I will, don't I will not detail, but if you, you make a basic reasoning about uh, the set of uh, all sets, then you, then you get the contradiction. And it's a killing contradiction. Uh, then there was a, a lot of uh, problems in the mathematical community for some years. And uh, Gödel, uh, in the 1920s or 30s, I don't remember, solved the problem and showed that you have sets which are small entities. And then you have proper classes, which are much bigger, but don't work like sets. Cannot be axiomatized like, like sets. And of course, does the proper class of uh, all, cla all classes of proper classes exist? The answer is yes, knowing that a set is a, a, a special case of a proper class. Uh, so, uh, Considering this, uh, you know, uh, is quite interesting and has have some consequences. First question is, can a set allow describing a proper class in a reliable way? And I don't know the answer to such a question, but at least uh, it is asked there. Uh, and uh, uh, this would be a quite a good subject of research because as far as I know, nobody tackled this problem. So in other terms, this gives uh, uh, other traditionally used sets for real or complex numbers powerful enough to describe our universe because our universe cannot be a set. Our universe must be a proper class because the universe, our universe con contains everything, even itself. Okay, this is the set of sets in some way. So uh, it's very strange that physicists try to approach and are so sure of them about uh, uh, explaining all the problems of, of our universe with tools which are maybe uh, not uh, adapted uh, and very limited to approach what our universe is. So I have a very big doubt about this. Uh, so now I'm coming more towards uh, what quantum physics is and I'm going to, to go to a uh, one of the actions I told you about in the beginning of my presentation. So let us consider quantum orthodox physics and let us consider the position vector R. If you make a measurement, you are going to choose physically, experimentally, an eigenvalue, an eigenvector of the operator R, which I, I call here R0. And this is a value of in the spectrum of the uh, emission operator, uh, and which is, a, in fact, a, a triple of, uh, of real values. Uh, and therefore, what does it mean? It means that when you carry out an experiment to measure the position of uh, a particle, for example, nature or your, your set, experimental set, is going to choose one value. I don't say how it, it's chosen, but it's a choice. And so if it's a choice, you are going to pick one value in the spectrum of the operator. And so in mathematics, this is exactly what we call a choice function. And the choice function makes us think about the action of choice, uh, which was uh, settled in the, uh, it was set up in the 1930s. There were a lot of discussions 
But now, if you look at the math which has been elaborated since the 1930s, uh, half of the math we know today rely on the uh, axiom of choice. So if you remove it from the set of actions, uh, you lose a lot. So let's take it for granted. Uh, and even more that, you know, quantum physicists say that it's not only an action, but it's an acting action. It's a, a really uh, physically existing. Uh, so what is interesting is that if we use it like quantum physicists do for the uh, uh, position vector, for example, you know the choice function starts from 2 to the r, so the set of the power set of r into r. And this is quite interesting because 2 to the r uh, has a cardinal which is called, we call this Aleph 2, uh, if we accept the generalized hypothesis of continuity. Uh, if we don't, uh, it's a bit more tricky, but uh, it doesn't matter. It's more than Aleph 1 for sure, uh, with the uh, uh, Cantor Bernstein theorem. And uh, so we see that if we do this, the function, the choice function, which exists once again physically here, uh, operates on a set which is very big, much bigger than R, much bigger than C, much bigger than the quaternions, the octonions, much bigger than the any Hilbert space, even of infinite dimension. Uh, and so uh, it prevents the, the, this set to be what we call Archimedean. So the, the, the physics, the very physics operates in something which is and cannot be Archimedean. So therefore quantum physics contains in itself already the ingredients of the non-Archimedean space. But you know, uh, there is more than this which, which we can say. If you have a part of your physics which operates in something which is not Archimedean and of the form 2 to the r, I said it's, it's much, much greater than any Hilbert space. The problem is that you describe your physical objects in something which is a Hilbert space, whatever its dimension. And then you have some kind of operator which operates magically, which is outside this. But you never look at this. Physicists don't never look at this. They just look at it in the Hilbert space. So they see only a part of the game and not the whole. So I'm coming back to non-Archimedean space. And I will uh, just uh, remind you uh, what it is. Uh, basically, uh, the Archimedes action says that when you are in a space, whatever it is, if you take any three points, all different. And if you want to go from A to B with steps of length AC, then starting from A, with the finite number of, of steps of length AC, one day you will reach B. Saying that you are non-Archimedean non, non means that there is a C, so that for going from A to B, you will need an infinite number of steps of length AC to reach B, not a finite one. And you see the big difference. And this is a very uh, uh, disruption. Disruption occurs there. Why? Because you see, what is the distance between A and B? If you are in an Archimedean space, you will have a finite, uh, uh, a finite length for AB because this is a the number of times, more or less, uh, 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 of steps you, you will have made to go from A to B. Now, if you need an infinity uh, of steps, you, you will have for you with the, the standard of the length AC, you, you will think that the, the distance is infinite. But if you look on the picture, it's not infinite. So it means that in Archimedean geometry, what is infinite and what is not? is something, a relative notion. It's not absolute. Uh, so in addition, if you consider, for example, at your scale, so let's say that our scale is the scale of AB and we consider that the, the length of AB is uh, finite, then if you need an infinity of steps of length AC to go from A to B, 
it means that the length AC is infinitesimal. And this is the way uh, non Archimedean spaces work, basically. Uh, in uh, non standard analysis, we know non Archimedean fields, so called the fields of hyperreals. And generally, they are constructed by R to the n. n is, an, is uh, the, the power is the, the, uh, the set of natural numbers uh, of integers. And you, ne you need to take the quotient with k, which is an ultra, a non-trivial ultra filter. And we cannot build such a, a field, uh, uh, an ultra filter k. Its existence is given by the action of choice. So why this is why, in part, partly, I, I was speaking about the action of choice before. Uh, but this representation, unfortunately, is not unique, and we, we, it is disqualified. We cannot use it uh, correctly. So it only remains to consider uh, what we call no, with uh, the name of the field of serial numbers, which will, was built by John Conway in 1974. So let's say if you want to have a picture, this is kind of the completion of the different fields of hyperreals, and th this one is complete, and you cannot go on. And of course, this is not a set, but this is a proper class, and this is a field as the reals, like the reals. It means that you can multiply, you can divide, you can so on. Okay. Uh, so, I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. The physical consequences of this is that we have both infinite and infinitesimal magnitudes. The infinite, as I told you, and infinitesimal become relative notions. We shall have infinitesimal particles constituting the particles at our scale, the electron. So I'm coming back to what I said before when I, I showed you a contradiction. We don't have any more contradiction if we consider that our geometry is uh, non-Archimedean. We, we can go down like this and consider, uh, as I told you, uh, proper classes. And, you know, we have infinitesimal particles. Can they have an effect at our scale? I, uh, okay. And the answer is yes. If omega is the first infinite number, let's say this, like, like this, and, and if you, you take omega particles of size 1 over omega, the, the length is 1. So you can, if you have infinitely many infinitesimal particles, you can have an effect at a scale. Um, so let's go on with the physical consequences of this. All physicists have had to deal with one day or another point particles. And today in the standard model, the electron has no volume. So you have something with a charge with nothing in it which is strange, and nobody complains about this. I do complain about this. So the idea is just take a sphere of diameter one over omega, fill it with infinitely many infinitesimal particles so that there is a, an effect at our scale. But you know, instead of having nothing in it, we have an infinity of infinitesimal particles and in a volume which is infinitesimal to us, so we will never be able to see it and that there is something infinitesimal like this. So for us, it's exactly equivalent as if it was a dimensionless point, which is not, which it is not, it is not. But we have now a causality to the charge of the electron. We don't have nothing like in quantum physics today. Um, so, and this changes dramatically uh, the structure of the atom and the nucleus. We can, we can have a, a lot of this. I have made some publications on this, which have been uh, published uh, in Elsevier, uh, for example, uh, and uh, which give uh, an, a bed, much better idea of how the nucleus works and can work. So, now the geometric consequences, because uh, I, I went to physics. Now let me come back to mathematics, because you know, as usual, physics and mathematics do interfere together. So we can therefore consider any system of particles as a set of points, provided that we are aware that the sets themselves are proper classes, as I told you. Typically, the components of the electron. Uh, we can also tackle the problem of physics through 
pure geometry considering first the properties of particles as the consequences of their very geometry at the infinitesimal scale. I will show you uh, the approach after that in the next slide. And what we mean here is that all the forces in nature, which are believed today coming from particles, would be the consequences of their internal geometry. This includes electromagnetism as well as gravitational mass. For now, I shall exclude inertial mass and I will come uh, back to it later. I'm going to introduce you Curie theorem. Curie theorem was uh, set in uh, 1894 and it was for crystallography. And basically what Curie said is that uh, in a crystal, if everything is symmetrical, then nothing happens. If you want to have a phenomenon, you need to have some dissymmetry. And this is the dissymmetry which, cre which creates the phenomenon. So in my opinion, it's legitimate to consider the laws of crystallography as kind of universal, uh, given what I said before uh, about the uh, geometry of our, our universe. And this brings, this has brought me to revisit what symmetry means mathematical symmetry, uh, but uh, you know the big stake with uh, the theorem of Curie is that it seems to contradict the second principle of thermodynamics. Why? Because you know, uh, when you have maximum entropy, which means maximum disorder, nothing occurs. And everybody intuitively thinks that when you have a symmetric picture, you have order, you have the maximum order. And so what Curie's theorem says basically is that we would go from dissymmetry to symmetry in the evolution of a system of a crystal, for example. And so we would go dissymmetry disorder to symmetry order. So it seems very contradictory. Uh, another clue, uh, which is uh, much more controversial, but you know, when you look back into history, the ancient Greeks, Egypt, ancient Egypt, and so on, what did they, what did they let for us? They, they just let for us some pictures like this with symmetries everywhere. So maybe it means that there is a message in it uh, telling us that this is the most important thing in nature. This is what I think, and I cannot prove it, but this is an ID, and that, you know, the kind of heritage we, we are left by these civilizations, telling us symmetry is the, the basis of, of our world. So, it brought me to redefine what a symmetry is. So, basically, you see on the right, uh, what I call a, sym a symmetric figure is that if there is a subgroup of the group of symmetries, uh, um, of uh, isometries, sorry, uh, a non-trivial one, which leaves the set uh, uh, unchanged. Uh, so basically, there is no real uh, difference with what mathematicians believe today. So nothing extraordinary there. But this is not over. Then I'm speaking about the distinguishability uh, principle. So if we want to distinguish things, you, you must not alterate the space uh, to distinguish. Otherwise, if you alterate the space, of course, you change the rules of the game. So we are in space and we want to distinguish things. If we want to distinguish things, the idea is we can only distinguish them uh, by using the measurement we have. So the distance basically, because in geometry, there is always a distance uh, in general. Uh, in uh, projective geometry, it's a bit more tricky, but we can always uh, define a distance on it. Um, and then, so uh, I just say that two sets are, indis are indistinguishable, E and F, if whatever any arbitrary order on E, uh, there exists a non-trivial group of isometries of G uh, of the space then such that for all the isometries of this group we have F of E equal, equals F of course but also that the ordered sets are 
uh, the same. And when you do this, and it's not written here, but uh, believe me, please, um, what is the consequence of this? The consequence of this is that if you consider any symmetric figure, uh, it, is, it has maximum disorder inside it. And I will uh, tell you why uh, just after that, not why maximum disorder, but why I say inside. Okay, so Curie's theorem is only the second, the second principle applied to geometry, second principle of, of, of thermodynamics applied to geometry. Uh, just to uh, generalize what I said, uh, you know, uh, the, the definition of symmetry, you can modify it a bit and you can speak about the symmetry viewed from a point. So here you have the example of a square. If you have the, let's say you look at the square from the outside, so with the uh, green point, you take the symmetry, uh, uh, orthogonal symmetry uh, with the axis of the, di through the diagonal of the square. And when you, you, you do this symmetry, the, the, the green point goes to the, um, uh, to, to the yellow one, whereas the, the square has not changed. But your point of view is not the same. And so the square is not symmetric viewed from the outside from the, from the green point. In fact, it's, it's not symmetric viewed from any point, but points which are on the diagonal. Uh, so uh, there is an equivalent in physics uh, in high school uh, when you have the d'Alembert uh, uh, principle for centrifugal force and the Newton point of view for the centripetal force. You have two points of view and what I did here is just to uh, reproduce this uh, kind of uh, different point of views be between d'Alembert and Newton uh, in physics into geometry. And so you have uh, you, the square is symmetrical from viewed from the inside, of course, with the definition I gave, but it's dissymmetric for viewed from the outside, basically. Uh, so, um, uh, if I apply now the physics uh, of uh, 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 Curie to this, uh, we shall say that according to Curie's theorem, uh, for a particle to be stable, it must be symmetric from the inside. If it is not, it cannot be stable and it will disappear. Uh, as the free neutron, for example, quickly splits in nature, as you all know, uh, because it's not a symmetrical particle from the outside. Okay, but if you look from the uh, from the inside, sorry, but if you look from the outside to the particle, as you saw from for the square, of, it's it's uh, the same for all all the shapes, in fact, which are symmetrical from the uh, uh, inside. When you look at them from the outside they have a dissymmetry, okay? They are dissymmetric. And this is what creates the phenomenon according to Curie's theorem. And all the phenomenon which we see, all the forces come from these dissymmetries. And of course, the, the systems of particles or whatever are going to evolve towards a, a configuration which will be at maximum symmetric. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is basically the model I, I propose. Uh, and so all the forces which are created are linked to these elements in the symmetry uh, groups, uh, which are under scrutiny, including the transitory states. Strong transitory states. So uh, for me, all this is purely geometrical. All the forces have geometrical origin. Uh, let's keep on. If we consider the electron, it has at least three types of symmetries at stake. One giving the charge, what we call the charge, one giving gravitation, and one giving its magnetic momentum. Uh, just please notice that with such an approach, the photon, for example, has a mass and can and create gravitation. So there is no uh, extraordinary thing in the fact that, uh, you know, uh, when uh, going next to the sun, it would be bent because, uh, okay, and even De Broglie, so thought that the, the photon had the mass and uh, he evaluated it to 10 to the minus 64 grams 
which, which is out uh, of reach of our means today to, to make any measurement of this kind. So we have room for playing with geometry for two, true anti-gravity, that is a repulsive force if the negative masses exist, like, like if, as if the negative masses existed, because you know you can play with symmetries. And if there is a, a kind of dissymmetry which makes uh, 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 particles attract each other, why not uh, tune the different uh, uh, dissymmetries we know uh, and which are at stake, basically uh, uh, electromagnetism and gravitation, so that we we have we might have as a result a negative a negative or a repulsive force. What I was able to to, to prove is that the the approach uh, doesn't guarantee that the repulsive force will be in one over r square, but at least what can be shown proved is that the theory allows proving that it decreases with the distance as a polynomial in r, which is not so bad as a result, but one over r square is is I was not able to reach it. Um, engineering consequences. So today we have our, at our disposal for engineering only gravitational and electromagnetism, as I told you already. The internal assumed forces inside matter cannot be played with uh, because I think that they are artifacts, in fact, not really existing. Uh, the engineering step that we can think about is whether the symmetries are at stake giving uh, birth uh, uh, are giving birth to gravitation and electromagnetism allow generating the whole set of symmetries which are possible at the infinitesimal scale basically what i say here is if electromagnetism and gravitation are the basis of all the group of symmetries we are done we can do uh, probably anti gravity uh, and we have a cherry on the cake is that if our space, uh, you know, I, I removed the Archimedes uh, action uh, uh, before. Now, if we go into a high hyperbolic geometry in addition, uh, so then we have an inf a truly infinite uh, um, set of possibilities for this, and we can achieve much more than if the if our universe would be Euclidean or uh, uh, Riemannian, with, I mean, with a positive curvature. So negative curvature is much, much better and allows much more possibilities. Let's cross our finger that this is the case. Uh, it would be very nice because it means that research will never end and we will always find something new. Uh, now, for the problem of space trips, you know, anti-gravity is not uh, really the panacea because uh, it, it's only worth uh, next to a mass. Uh, if we want to travel quickly into space, uh, we need to deal with the inertial mass. And with the diagram uh, just uh, on the right, uh, this is just to remind you that, uh, you know, when Newton discovered the universal gravitation, um, uh, Fatio uh, and Le Sage uh, explained at that time that uh, there was some kind of an ether with uh, isotropic uh, speeds and that there was a shadowing of the masses. And this is why you get uh, the, the law of Newton in one over square. So. Uh, Poincaré, all the all the, the great physicists in, in the history of physics looked at that until Poincaré. Poincaré looked at this theory and showed that if um, uh, the ether was were true particles, then the, the temperature of the Earth would be 10 to the 26 uh, degrees Kelvin, and which is not the case, of course. And so they killed this theory. But with what I told you, and with infinitesimal particles, uh, Poincaré's proof no more works. So I come back to this principle. And as you see, it, it can allow shielding, gravity, uh, anti-gravity, a lot of things which are believed to be impossible today. Uh, so how can we interpret this? I'm, I'm, I'm done very quickly now. I'm, I'm at the end of my presentation. So. Our non-Archimedean physics partly allows such a point of view as viewed before. Uh, we all know the Lorentz transform and uh, it can be interpreted in some way by a non-Newtonian fluid, 
uh, made of infinitesimal particles, for example. And this works pretty well. You can find against, again, the Lorentz transform and, and find things which are quite interesting. Uh, I did this uh, work with, uh, kind of with in, an Italian friend. Another interpretation consists in saying that the speed of the ether particles is infinite, which can be the case, uh, you know, uh, because uh, for very particular uh, reasons in uh, non Archimedean geometry, we can have infinite speeds at the infinitesimal scale. Not necessarily, we can have relativity for our scale and infinite, infinite speeds at the infinitesimal scale, which is quite interesting and allows to uh, a, a good physical interpretation of what entangled particles are. Uh, and in uh, this latter case, uh, we can have theoretical equivalence between the gravitational mass and the inertial one. So in fact, uh, you know, I'm surprised that we still carry out experiments to verify that there is the equivalence at uh, 10 to the minus 10 or 15, I don't remember, between gravitational mass and inertial mass. We spend a lot of money in this. And when we do this, this is just to verify, nobody has any clue that why it would be different. I would understand that we carry out such an experiment if someone has a clue why it's different, but this is never the case, it's just to verify. We will never verify because today maybe it's 10 to the minus 15, tomorrow we will need 10 to the minus 30 or 10 to the minus 100, and this is no way. So in this case, I have full equivalence between gravitational mass and inertial mass, and so, uh, no need of any experiment of this type. Uh, once again, I'm almost done. So uh, just look at this, uh, which is quite interesting. We, see th we have seen that the action of choice is physically at stake in quantum physics, and we kept it. Now, a well-known consequence of the action of choice in geometry is the Banner-Tarski paradox. Take a sphere. There is a way to cut the sphere into five parts. And then you, you use isometries, I insist on this, to remove away these, four, these, four, these five parts. And then using isometries again, you, you move them again together. And from the one sphere, you get two spheres identical to the first one, which seems quite contradictory. This is why this is called the paradox. And it was proved in 1927, so a long time ago. Now look at the Hamiltonian. Of, a, of any system, uh, and uh, it, it creates, I, I told you before, the, there is, this is the an energy surface, okay, but uh, this is an hypersurface. And the Banner-Tarski paradox works for a, a dimension uh, greater than or equal to three. So as soon as you have two particles, you are in this case. And so there is a way to cut this Hamiltonian into several parts, use isometries, which means no use of any energy, and to paste it back into twice the energy you had in the beginning. So you can create, uh, uh, you can create uh, energy, double the energy you had, and you can reproduce this as many times as you want. So you have infinite energy with this. So today, why is it not possible in traditional quantum physics? This is because of the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle, because you, the, the way you, you cut the, the sphere needs to be very accurate. But if we are in uh, uh, non-Archimedean geometry, we have no more problem with the uh, Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle. So we can cut very, very accurately and we can use this. And so we can create energy, infinite energy out of it. This is purely theoretical. I don't have a clue how to do this in, in practice, but for sure this works. And there is no flaw in it, at least with the assumptions I, I took. Um, now, my conclusion. Uh, so echoing what was said in the beginning with non-Archimedean physics, we can create energy out of our world in infinite quantity, but it's not out of nothing, please notice. We can order things as much as we want uh, or need. Uh, in the sense of creating order, we can have infinite accuracy. We can fly and communicate quicker than the speed of light. 
through a conversion from the real scale to the infinitesimal scale and then back. So uh, at least for communications, I have published uh, already a, a, a scheme of uh, communications quicker than the speed of light uh, based on entangled particles and uh, which works uh, with this theory needs to be tested experimentally. Uh, and uh, we can find uh, a cause to every phenomenon, uh, even if this is not, the, and it will never be the ultimate root cause. Uh, you know, so I solved uh, during this presentation all of the problems I uh, showed you in the very beginning. Uh, we are back to the man of the Middle Ages, which can perform anything he wants, at least he can dream of, uh, if he cannot yet. And so physics is great again. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much.